Yagi antennas. Now, we kind of touched on Yagi antennas back in the 2.4 gig series, but I really didn't go into uh, how to design them. Primarily because for 2.4 gig, they're extremely hard to get very accurate measurements. Now, we're going to be focusing closer on the, uh, the amateur radio frequencies, our 2 meter and 70 centimeter, or if applicable, uh, GMRS or uh, uh, FRS and PMR radios, which op all operate at about 465 megahertz and 70 centimeter being in the 440. Uh, 430 to 450 center band being 440, which is why it's called 440, but anyway. Okay, so I'm rambling. Here is one of the antennas that I designed recently. Yagi's are a type, or a beam antenna, as some people like to call it, consists of the boom, which is usually a non-conductive material. I would suggest non-conductive for ease of use. Now, the boom is what holds the elements. Now, this element in the front here is called a director or parasitic element. All of the elements that are in front of the driven element, meaning the active dipole antenna, are called directors or parasitic elements. And the very last one in the ass end right here, this one is called a reflector. Now what happens is when radio energy hits this antenna, each one of the elements, are, so here's a reflector, or driven element, a director, a director, and if you had more and more, it'd just get longer and longer. Now the dipole, the distance that, that these are, um, the distance between these will adjust the standing wave ratio. I'm not really going to get into the standing wing, calculating standing wave ratio of dipoles because it's extremely hard. We'll get into other ways of finding standing wave ratio in, in forms of antennas later. So all of the directors will, will be up to 5% smaller than the one in front of it, and it's precisely calculated up to 25% shorter in an exponential of minus j. It's really complicated math when it comes to Yagi antennas, so we're really just going to focus on putting them together and just using software to create them. And we're really not going to get into the complicated math because I could spend three hours on that alone and I really don't understand all of it. So, now most of the time when we've been designing dipoles, we've been using just an, what's called an open end fed dipole, meaning uh, it's just two wires going in, in separate directions, either horizontal or vertical. Now, Yagi's have the option to use a, a, a closed fed dipole, which is just a loop. It's a direct short. And the reason we use this is primarily so we can change the impedance to match on the feed line or coax. But we're not going to do that because, honestly, when you're, when you're, when you're designing a Yagi, if you're off measurement, now because we're going to be operating on lower frequencies than, than microwave, 2.4 gigahertz, we, our measurements can be fairly off. So you don't have to be anal retentive about your measurements. But if your driven element, if your dipole is off measurements and it's a fed, uh, a, a, a closed loop dipole, and that loop is just off measurement, all of these will be thrown off. So it'll just throw your gain off and your patterns and all that. So this is just one of them that I've made. And this is a collapsible one, which I'll show you in a little bit. It's kind of big. This one's for two meters, so it's going to get kind of big. But... Uh, we're going to go to the software side, and we're going to go check out Quick Yagi and another application that's used for uh, simulating and building Yagi antennas off of calculators. Here we have Quick Yagi for DOS application, but eh, you can run it in DOSBox or QEMU if you're not running a, a Windows machine that can do DOS or you know Linux or OS X. Okay, so this application will automatically design Yagi antennas for you up to 999 megahertz, so no 2.4 gig stuff. Okay, so we're going to go through some of the options real quick. So you hit F2, you can change from metric to uh, uh, imperial, back and forth, no problem, or the type of fed element, which is really important. Now you have to select whether you're going to be using a simple dipole, a folded dipole. I prefer simple dipole just because the measurements on them are a whole hell of a lot easier to deal with. And, you don't have to really worry about you know getting all your your bends in in proper uh, proper alignment. So our operating oh, wait, let's go back a bit. So we're going to go to auto mode and auto design a Yagi, and we're going to go and optimize for maximum 
front to back ratio and bandwidth because we don't care about the spacings. We care about a broader frequency range. Now, we're going to uh, design our first antenna for 440 megahertz, which lies directly in the middle of the amateur radio 70 center band, 70 centimeter band. Now, you can also do this for uh, the PMR and FRS bands as well. Now, will all elements be the same diameter? Yes. Number of directors or parasitic elements? We're going to do two. The antenna I just showed you, two. Uh, element uh, diameter in inches is uh, 0.1. Now it's going to automatically calculate through all this. Let's take some of let's let's look at some of this information. The array length is going to be 0 0.87 feet. Now we're going to have an estimated gain of 8.17 decibels. Now we're operating at a center frequency of 440 megahertz. The reflector length, the very last element on the antenna, is going to be 1.12 feet. The fed element, your dipole, needs to be 1.07 feet. The reflector spacing, the spacing from the reflector to the dipole, will be 0.27 feet. We have two directors with a 0.1 inch diameter. We have the first director, the spacing from the dipole to the first director will be 0.22 feet. The second and last director on the tip of the antenna will be 0.36 feet. Now, unfortunately, I have to put some screenshots up in the show notes of the um, and explain the, the plotting option, the F3 here. But you can see the estimated radiated pattern. If you remember when I was first explaining how to do, uh, like, how antennas work and what their purpose is, I was explaining with a balloon and how you're manipulating RF energy. Well, this will show you the plotted uh, frequency range in which you'll get the best reception as well as what your, your receiving and transmitting pattern will look like. So, let's go and see if we can boost up and make a little bit more oomph out of this. So we're going to reset the software. We're going to hit AAM, 440 megahertz. All elements will be the same diameter, number of directors. Let's go with 15. And we're going to do 0.1 inches. It's going to take a little while to go and, and calculate through all of this. And if you notice now with 15 elements, we'll get 13 and a half decibels of gain, but we're almost nearing 8 feet. And the more elements you add to a Yagi antenna, the more precise, more beam-like it gets. It becomes less directional, more directional. I will put some images up on the show notes about this. So this is Quick Yagi. This is a, a very good application to allow you to automatically generate and uh, engineer Yagi antennas. Now let's go to the table side and look at some of the engineering aspect. Alrighty, so we've gone through quick Yagi real quick and we've designed a, uh, a Yagi antenna. Now I don't have the coax on this so you'll have to bear with me. Now this, as I've mentioned, is the reflector. This is going to catch radio waves that have either come from the side or have been passed over the director uh, elements. This is your your driven element. This will be a simple dipole fashion, uh, non-closed loop. You know, I'm a dipole. Hi, uh, how's it going? And these are going to be your parasitic or your director elements. So the radio waves are going to enter the front of the antenna or, in fact, being transmitted out and focused using these elements. Now, in this specific design, all I've really used was uh, spokes from a bicycle. I've just cut them. I, well, first I stapled them on, then I had to hammer the staples down to make them re really solid. Now, you can also use any, any conductive material. So, you know, you can use copper wire, you can use axles, you can use copper pipe. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, you can get uh, re really nice axles or, or steel rod, and there's the uh, the U-shaped uh, tack downs for coax that you can use to tack it down. Now, some people will use a conductive material like maybe, say, aluminum to go and hold all of their uh, their elements on. But you have to make sure that your driven element is not being conducted into the boom of the uh, the antenna. So try to uh, make sure that this is mm, isolated from your driven element. This is usually why I use plastic or wood. That end, it's kind of easy to work with. Now, when working with PVC pipe, it's got a round top and it's a bitch to drill into, especially when you... So I like to use flat wood. Of course, this would be more of a portable antenna. It really wouldn't be uh, something I'd put outside. Now, as for attaching your your uh, your coax, all you'd have to do is either solder to each side. If you're using uh, metal that you can't solder onto, you can use. Let me get this out for you. You can go ahead and crimp on 
ring connectors. These are automotive ring connectors in which you can either solder onto these or you can use nut, nuts and bolts and just create a, uh, like a little clamp down for, you, for, your, uh, for your feed line. Now, of course, as always, you want to use the proper feed line for the appropriate frequency. And that's just the basic build of, of a Yagi. Now, I've, I've got this one here. This was made on an old, uh, an old uh, hockey stick, and I've got TV and element, uh, TV and ten elements that can pull out. And we'll uh, we'll go out and do a different angle on this thing because it's uh, it's close to three feet long. Okay, let's do a recap. This is a 70 centimeter amateur radio antenna. Now this is tuned for 440 megahertz. We just built this. So it has two director elements, one driven element, which is a simple dipole, as well as a reflector element. And Quick Yagi has helped us design uh, the length of the reflector, the length of the dipole, the length of each director, and the spacing between them. And this would be the back of the antenna, and this would be the front of the antenna, and the dipole is always the second element in the antenna. And all the ones in the front are called directors. Now, this isn't too bad. Uh, you know, we got a nice non-conductive, sturdy wooden material, and we got some nice elements that are pretty much just tacked on with staples. And here is another antenna that I mentioned uh, a little while ago. This is the one that I use TV antennas on. Uh, the old, uh, you know, old bunny ear style antennas. Now, unfortunately, this one was designed for uh, two meters, 144 megahertz center frequency, and I used a magic marker, which I'm uh, to mark where the antenna lengths need to be extended. But uh, I'm just th throwing this together to show you the size difference here. Okay, this is two meter amateur radio, 144 megahertz compared to 444 megahertz. Big difference here because like I've been explaining all this time that when your frequency changes, when your frequency increases, your wavelength shrinks. Thus a smaller antenna and harder to make. When you have lower frequencies, your antenna is much bigger, but they are much more forgiving. So this is just some of the basics of, of Yagi antenna design. I'll put a bit in the show notes about this. Now the discrete math and whatnot is extremely complicated and I really don't feel that I'm one to explain it and um, you know you're gonna just spend a whole lot more time wasting pencil lead and pulling out your hair trying to figure out a lot of the discrete math unless you're a really hardcore math nerd. Now if now there's nothing wrong with that it's just <sighs> over my head. So you can rely on software. I got two more applications that are Java applications that will allow you to, um, to uh, uh, design antennas and whatnot, uh, Yagi specifically, and it, they'll even account for what material you're using, whether it be uh, steel, aluminum, gold, you know, it, it takes a lot into account. So, uh, I'll put a lot in the show notes. This is just some of the build design and techniques. It's really simple once you understand the, the like four major components of a Yagi being the boom, the reflector, the driven element, and the reflecting elements, or sorry, the, uh, the parasitic or director elements. So, um, alright, I gotta cut this, cut this off here. If you have any questions or comments, you can always catch me on IRC or on the forums. I have fun, everyone. Okay, well, today I got in my new Triple E PC, and I noticed it came with the Xandros operating system on it. Out of the box, it felt kind of crippled to me, and I wasn't too thrilled, but I did some exploring, did some Googling, and I found out how to unlock the potential of it. And it's actually not as bad as it first seemed. If you look at the screen right now, it kind of, uh, this is what it comes with out of the box. Kind of reminds me a lot of like the old version of Windows CE. I guess this wouldn't really be too bad of an operating system to have uh, if you want to give it to your kids or your girlfriend, and there's really not much they can screw up, so it's not too bad or even if you did a touchscreen mod which Fox has done on his triple E I guess this operating system would be kinda nice for a touchscreen but for me it just it doesn't cut it uh, this laptops or triple E sorry is I wanted to run Linux because I have a second triple E here which is faster and I'm gonna use Windows on this one so I wanted to see what exactly I could do with Sanders so there's an advanced mode and today I'm going to show you how to unlock that with the advanced mode it brings you to a full KDE desktop I know KDE seems bloated and everything but it's very simple to do and give it a try see what you like
Press Control, Alt, and T to bring up a terminal window because you're going to need a terminal screen to do the following commands. Next, you want to type in wget http colon slash slash download.tuxfamily.org forward slash eeepc repos forward slash key.asc. If it seems I'm going a little bit fast, I'll have all of this in the show notes, so just check out the show notes and it'll be a lot easier. Uh, press enter after you type that in, then type in sudo space app dash key space key space key dot ASC. Again, check the show notes or pause the video. After that, you want to stay in the terminal window and type in sudo space synaptic and press enter. This will open the synaptic uh, package manager, which should help you with the rest of the steps. If not, there's other methods that I will list in the show notes if the synaptic method doesn't work. But in Synaptic Package Manager, choose Settings and Repositories and press New. Then enter in the URL that I'm um, pasting up on the screen or that will be in the show notes. Fuck it, I ain't reading this shit out for you. Anyway, enter the distribu Distribution uh, P701 and then enter the section Main or Main Etch if you want more additional software. And press the new and add in the next URL, http colon slash slash updates dot eeepc dot aces dot com forward slash p701. Enter the distribution p701 and the selection is main. And press OK and then press reload. Now in the synaptic package manager, scroll down to advanced desktop eepc and check that to upgrade, or I'm sorry, to install. If that doesn't work, just type in sudo space apt-get install advanced-desktop-eeepc. Once you're done, shut down the desktop and boot up in full desktop mode. And that should get you into the operating system, which we've already done, so I'm gonna show you on screen. Okay. Full desktop mode. And the EEPC will reboot. As you see, it doesn't take too long to boot up. And now we have a full KDE desktop that we can do whatever we want with, pretty much. Uh, you can install other applications that aren't necessarily meant for the Triple E. Uh, just a warning, Xandros uh, is based off of Debian, but it doesn't work with all Debian applications. I know yesterday I tried installing uh, couple different applications and I ended up crashing the operating system and I had to reinstall so uh, use some caution when playing around and join the join the forums and on the forums let us know what applications you got running successfully on yours and which you had problems with so the rest of us know anyway I hope you found this useful and uh, read the show notes of course I'll try and put more information as I come across it and uh, Enjoy. So, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to overclock this ever so slightly because the last time you saw what happened and it's not going to be good if I do that again because that means I'm probably going to fry another SATA cable. Anyway, we're going to go in the jumper free configurations, go into here, set this to manual because I had to reset the defaults, 
and we're going to crank the CPU frequency up again, which is probably a bad idea. But we're going to go with a very, 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 very mild overclock. It'll show you the difference, and that's all that we really need to do right now. Now, as you're overclocking this and upping this frequency right here, it's going to up the um, frequency on your RAM because you're not setting your RAM on automatically it said or you're not sitting independently it said automatically and if you go down to the AGP there's it's in a different section but it the frequency also affects the north bridge which is going to affect your speed for your video for uh, throughput so we're going to reboot right now and this processor happens to have a 14 times multiplier so you take 14 times 202 and that will be the speed of the processor and we'll see that as I put it up, and we'll see exactly what that equals because I'm not doing the math in my head. So 2.82 gigahertz. So basically, it's a nothing for an overclock. But the thing is, I'm just showing you the difference. So it's 2827 instead of 2.800. That's okay. So we'll reboot into Windows now, and hopefully it works this time. And then we'll go into hardware monitor, which will show you voltages, temperatures, north bridge, all kinds of nice stuff. And we'll go into running a simple benchmark that's used by most gamers to benchmark the entire system. It'll benchmark your CPU, your sound card, your video card, and your RAM. All at the same time, very good way to test it. And you'll get a general idea of where you want to be in your actual system. Alright, so we're going to start up hardware monitor first and this is going to give us our temperatures and our voltages and as you can see you have your starting value the min and the max. This is what's going to be the current value of what is actually going on. This is the minimum value, this is the max value. So it's going to give you a range of where your power supply is actually moving through, which will give you really good information on whether you have a noisy power supply due to the frequency of the electricity going through it. You'll also have this, which is your temperatures. You have your system, your CPU, and this one I'm pretty sure is my north bridge, but that doesn't make sense because it's saying it's 123 degrees Celsius, which if it was, it would be melting through my motherboard. This is an example of a bad temperature read definitely because if there was anything this hot in my computer I would be crying right now because everything would be burning um, this is the CPU fan obviously CPU fan it, th this is pretty much self-explanatory if you can't figure out that this is your hard drive temperature I feel incredibly incredibly sorry for you alright guys it's it's this is simple stuff now if you can't figure this out, you shouldn't be touching the rest of this stuff. And I'm going to reiterate, overclocking will void warranties. It can burn up anything in your computer, and if you don't know what you're doing, you can screw it up. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It just means do your research. I happen to know the temperature for the CPU. This can go up to 65 degrees Celsius, as I said earlier. Um, it can also have a minimum clock of five de or minimal temperature of five degrees Celsius when we underclock. There are certain limits to CPUs when you go to underclock them to make them run slower to give you more um, battery power on said laptops. This happens to be a desktop so it's not that big of a deal but we'll get into underclocking. Right now we're going to start up 3D Mark 06. I happen to have a registered version of it so I have all of the nice features and everything. And this is going to take quite a bit of time to start up, so we'll probably fast forward through this. But this is 3D Mark 06. Like I said, this is the benchmarking utility that will benchmark for gamers. They use it for sound, they use it for video, they use it for CPU, they use it for RAM. The only thing it really doesn't test that much is your hard drive. And there's other programs to do that. And of course, this is off screen because we're running in a smaller screen mode but all right first things first we need to go into the settings for image quality and change the resolution down so that we can screen cap it this will also affect um, the scores that you have when you're done this 
I leave all default. It's just much easier that way. So that way, when you're comparing results with other people, they normally use the defaults and they'll tell you what resolution they run and whether they're running anti-aliasing so you can compare and contrast your results with their results and see if your system is running at par. And this is 3D Mark 06 and it happens to be incredibly, incredibly bright right now. And it's going to take a few minutes to load and you got to remember this is on a P4 machine so okay that just saved a simple f image quality frame to the computer we'll close out of this now we're going to go into and select the actual benchmarks we're going to be running and because this is a registered one I can select all now as you notice this is HDR and shader model 3.0 the card I'm using is an X850 Pro that I flashed and put aftermarket cooling on to make it $150 worth $150 more and it became an X850 XTP8. Now th we're talking this is years ago, but this is one of the benefits of knowing your hardware and knowing you can overclock things. You can get an extra $150 out of your video card just by flashing the proper hardware and you have to make sure you can flash it etc so do your research you can really save some money now this is going to go through a whole bunch of different tests CPU tests this is shader model 2.0 and um, it's it's a very nice program and you will see as soon as I set up the filtering and anti-aliasing because we want to make sure this is at 640 by 480 once again and we'll close out of that and this keeps changing back and it's going to drive me nuts okay now we're going to run our 3d mark and it will give us our results once we are done and this is going to take a few seconds before it even starts to load the normal settings and once we're done with that it'll go through just like we saw before except it's not going to stop after the first frame you're going to see a whole lot of video and here it's going to slowly load because this is an old piece of shit computer and right here we have our scores um, this is actually an incredibly shitty score most of the decent computers out there nowadays are going to get at least double if not triple this um, CPU score sucks ass literally uh, because most of the computers nowadays they're dual core so you could just double this right off the bat if your processor is 2.8 gigahertz or higher and because of the um, better writing like the SS um, SSE 3 I believe it is SSE 2 is higher than SSSC1, which is all writing methods for the processor and everything, computing setups. And this would be Shader Model 2.0, and that is good God. And we have HDR and Shader Model 3.0 non applicable because this card is from 2005 and the ASN, or the beginning end of 2005, not the ASN. So. I could submit my results online, but I'd rather not. I can save them and never have it open again because for some reason I have issues with that with my computer. Or I can save them to Excel, which is the best way to do it if you ask me. Saves it as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, gives you a whole bunch of information. As you can see, that scroll bar go real, real small. Like, ridiculously small. And then you can go down and it has all kinds of information all kinds of stuff all of your codecs everything hexadecimal information for your CPU it's just a plethora of really good information okay what we have here is CPU C I'll have it in the show notes the link if it isn't already in that huge paragraph that's up there 
Um, what we have here is the core voltage, size of the CPU. This is obviously a really, really old P4, as you can tell. Um, it also has revision. Now, this can be important because what the revision is is the platter that they actually used to make all the CPUs. And the higher clocked CPUs are actually the ones that are more towards the center of the platter where the best cutting is actually going to be done when they're compressing the platters and cutting the CPUs out. But what the revision has to do with is if someone has that revision and they're hitting higher speeds, normally that revision is going to be really, really nice to use on your computer too. So revisions are sometimes listed and you'll also find that the first revisions of the CPUs are normally the better ones because what they actually do is they release only the better parts of the platter instead of the cheaper parts of the platter which is kind of gay but what else is new? Um, you'll have your cache which lists the L1 and the L2 cache the way it's set up. Main board will list the actual motherboard you're using all this great information and sometimes it lists the BIOS in the correct version and if you remember in the earlier segment this isn't the correct version at all if you go to memory it has the current clock speeds you're running the ratio from your CPU and front side bus to DRAM depends on how your motherboard set up whether it's CPU to FSB or FSB to DRAM considering this is DDR1 it's going to be FSB to DRAM then you go to SPD and normally you'll have multiple columns here of different frequencies with different settings and what this is all the timing table is is what's listed in the actual RAM on the SPD to tell the motherboard what to run it at if you're running at said frequency and it's also really nice because it gives you the part number and everything and you can look up things very easily without having to go oh shit what it is it crawl under my desk pull the side of my case off and look and see what RAM it is, and then if I can't read it, I have to shut down the computer, pull the RAM out. You know, it's a very nice program in that sense. So that's pretty much what it's used for. It's also nice. It tells you the instruction sets it has. It tells you the multiplier, which I went over. You take the bus speed times the multiplier, and you get your core speed. As you can see, this is slightly overclocked. Not much, but slightly because it was a 2.8 gigahertz processor and it gives you rated FSB which is the actual front side bus that the computer is running at and as you can see it correlates it's four times what the bus speed is pretty simple stuff make sure you do your research before you do anything as I mentioned before there is overclocking for video cards so we're going to minimize this and ATI tool of course not on the desktop so we'll go over here and go into ATI tool. This is a very nice program and it doesn't just work for ATI, it also supports a lot of the NVIDIA cards. But make sure you double check the actual uh, hardware or download information. It'll list what all cards it's able to do. Now um, what you can do is you can click these. These will find the max core temperature or max core speed to temperature ratio and you're able to set it in the back end what you want your max temperature to be and you can do the same thing with memory now this is great and everything it'll get you close to the max but the problem is if you're not paying attention or if your computer locks up and you don't notice it you can fry everything hence why I do everything by hand it takes longer but whatever the other thing is if you just want to test your video card that you just bought and make sure it doesn't have any artifacts on it it's basically so that the card is actually a good card you can click on this and what it'll actually do is start up this and it'll scan for artifacts and as soon as it sees one it's going to glow nice and yellow and then it'll normally give you an error message so long as your video card doesn't crap out and we're going to actually stop this because my video card was overheating when we were running the other benchmarks um, as you can see right here, there's a temperature information graph. It's pretty simple. It's a line graph. If you don't know how to use a line graph, I, I really don't know what to say to you. We have in here the actual device ID, the chip name. This is how I knew I was able to change my X850 into an X850 XTPE.
which is the next step up, which was an extra $150 at the time, because the chip name and the device ID were the same, and as you scroll down, the memory bus is the same. And you also have to check the dyes and substrates and fuses to make sure they're all right, the piping, everything. And it, it gets pretty intense in the stuff you can do. Um, you have the artifact scanning, which is the same thing as what's in the beginning. Uh, it's to show, set up all of the the amount of time you want it, the amount of time you want it to cool down. Uh, it's really, really, really nice setup for just about everything they have. Then you have temperature monitoring, and there's special things that you can set it up so that it can show it in the down in your actual tray down the bottom right hand corner next to the clock and everything. It's a very, very, very nice program and you can you have fan control. You can have it set to try to keep the GPO below a certain temperature, fixed percentage, or you could have it dynamically based like I have it set up right now. There's also gamma control where you can go in and edit the gamma brightness contrast. Pretty much the same as Cal's control center. You have startup, you can have it load on startup and load up an extra f high fan speed because say you have a default card and it runs hot, but you want to have that card last a while, you can ramp up the fan speed a little bit, but not fully 100% and have it run that way so that it keeps your card cool and extends the life of your graphics card. Um, 3D detection, pretty self-explanatory detects when something's open, detects when something's closed, so you can overclock it just for 3D games. Driver tweaks, this is all stuff that's normally controlled by Catalyst Control Center that you're able to go in here and change. And under miscellaneous you have all kinds of stuff, there's certain things, there's lock, locks on the really old Radeon cards um, before the X 1000 series and everything came out. There's the old 9000, 950 series, and you have to go in and click this to be able to overclock it. Alright, pretty simple. Now we're going to go back to the main. This is your GPU, this is your memory, and this is how you can overclock it. You can up it, or you can actually go in here and type in the actual amount you want, and it'll try to get it as close as possible. This is going to be your GPU temperature, this is going to be your memory temperature. And this is your fan speed, what it's running at. Then you can save it and make different ones for different things and have it set up so that you can load it a certain pro profile with each program you go and use. Very, very nice program. As you can see, it's showing the temperature down here. And if you hover it over it, it gives you the speed. It's a very nice program. Do not attempt to adjust your television set, computer monitor, or LCD flat panel. I am now in control. I control the light and the darkness. If I wish to make it louder, I'll scream. If I wish to make it softer, I'll bring it down to a whisper. I have the utmost control over your long distance telephone bills, and I can solve a Rubik's Cube in a single step. I control the horizontal, the vertical, and the... the... crap, wrong remote. Um, Right, segment, yeah. Um, I guess I'll go over Linux distros, because last month Fox went over what Linux is. So, right. Um, okay, so uh, this month I'm going to go over basic, lightweight Linux distros you can try right now. You can actually follow along with me and do it yourself. This is your hand, this is my hand. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go over Puppy Linux, DSL, Nopix and <clears throat> Nimblix. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can try these. Uh, just Google them to find them. I'm not gonna, you know, I said I was gonna hold your hand, but I lied. I'm not actually gonna do that because, as as much as everyone thinks I'm gay, I'm, I'm actually not. So I'm not gonna skip through the pansy fields and, and help you through this. You can do it yourself. You can find it. You can download it. You can burn the ISO. If you can't do that, skip back a couple episodes or like grab the nearest cell phone. And, and see if you can shove it in your entire mouth, just like, uh, and if you can get it in your throat, that'd be great, but, yeah, whatever, just do the best you can. Oh, batteries, try eating some batteries, too, that might help.
just to, you know, get your useless blob of fat off the planet. Um, anyway, uh, these, all of these Linux distros can be run off CD. You put the CD in your tray, and then you restart the computer, and you boot off the CD, and it boots Linux on it. It's amazing. It's this brand new technology. It's never been seen before. Um, besides CD, you can also boot it off USB. Um, Fox went over USB multi-boot a couple episodes ago. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention, but um, you should be able to figure that out by yourself if you can't. Again, batteries. They work really well. Just, just shove them up your nose or in your mouth. I don't know how well that worked, but yeah, they don't really stay. But um, DSL, you can actually download an embedded version of it that allows you to run it uh, in Windows. That's, that hurts now. It allows you to run it in Windows as an emulator. It uses QEMU, Q-E-M-U, QEMU. I don't know how you spell it, but you can run it in an emulator under Windows. So you can actually try Linux in Windows if you're that lazy and retarded. Um, Technically, you can use QEMU for anything, but I haven't had too much success with it, but I'm not a Linux master, I just use it. So, this I'm going to review these distros, and I'm going to go over the pros and cons of them, but it's going to be from a user standpoint, not from a Linux guru standpoint, so you're not going to get a lot of technical feedback from me. I'm just, I know how it works, I know what it does, but I'm not going to be able to show you... Uh, you know, the kernel boot up and everything. So let's go over to the computer and we'll get started. Just a quick blurb about Nopix here. Looks and feels similar to Nimblex, but offers a larger software collection out of the box. This one's live CD only and not recommended to install. It's also quite large at 700 megabytes, and they offer a DVD version with even more software and functionality built in. It feels bloated, it's not bad as it used to be. Um, they're using LDE as a window manager instead of KDE. Um, it can be disorganized, it's, uh, everything's kind of scattered about, but if you're looking for a quick way to try out a fatter, more graphic, bloodthirsty distro, then try Nopix. Oh, and if you got the horsepower, it also includes com uh, Compass Fusion and Barrel. If you don't know what either of those are, you're not missing out on anything except eye candy. This is DSL, the smallest distro I'll be showcasing today. The developers say it'll never go over 50 megs, but the functionality as a basic OS is still retained. Uh, it uses an older kernel to keep such a small size, and as such sacrifices some newer features and such. Uh, DSLN, a uh, branch off of DSL, is a bit bigger, but attempts to add this missing functionality while still keeping the size down. DSL is an awesome, really small distro that'll run on just about anything you throw it in. Um, when I was booting this off virtual machine, it, it booted really quickly. Like, I was surprised. The other ones have taken about five minutes to boot up so far because I'm on a crappy uh, AMD Athlon. But this just booted right up, and it's really responsive. So give it a shot. Nimblex. Fairly lightweight distro here. The default ISO weighs in at around 200 megabytes. Not too shabby, and it'll fit easily on smaller thumb drives or mini CDs. It runs really well on most hardware, has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi functionality right out of the box, as well as Firefox, GIMP, and mPlayer. Now the real advantage to using Nimblex is the ability to generate a custom ISO on their website, allowing you to add and remove dozens of packages and tailor it to exactly what you need. In Virtual Machine it's a bit laggy, as you can see, uh, running the KDE Window Manager, but they've also included support for a bunch of others, including Fluxbox. I think that would work better. Oh, the criticism I get for using Puppy, one of my favorite small Linux distros. It's updated regularly, and like DSL, runs on everything from the oldest hardware to the most cutting-edge system without a hitch. I myself have bashed Puppy for uh, using a proprietary package system, meaning you can only use packages that are made specifically for Puppy Linux, as opposed to standard Slackware or Debian apt-get packages. Um, Puppy guides you through installation and basic usage, and it's more than suitable for 90% of computer users out there for basic internet browsing, YouTube faggotry, and even writing that blog nobody gives a shriveled up monkey testicle about. You idiot, Leonard Nimoy was in both episodes. Yeah, you didn't notice that? Oh crap, I gotta go. Oh. Sorry. Okay. So you've seen some basic Linux distros, you know how they work, and you've seen their their pros and cons and stuff, but I... What? Hmm? Oh, she wants to know why you would use Linux over any other operating system. Well, my fine feathered friend, for one, it's free. 
not in the sense of, hey, free candy, grab, but in the sense that you know, information should be free. And if you read the GNU, GNU uh, license, you'll, you'll learn more about that. It's not free in the sense of like free beer, but it's, it's free, it's open source, it's, it's open software. Anyone can add to it, anyone can contribute. And uh, I mean, Linux is, is like, the, the license for Linux is about the same way that we run BSOD. We believe information should be free and we want to spread it around. We want people to, to have a basic understanding. We want people to know these concepts and understand them because we, we want uh, more leaders. We want more people that are out there doing what we do. And we want to spread this information like a virus. If knowledge is a virus, we want everybody to be infected. Now, that's probably not going to be the case, but um, we're going to try. Um, why else? Well, Linux is different. It is a lot different than using Windows. Um, different file system. Um, I guess it depends on what distro you're running, but the desktop is going to be different. Navigation's a little bit uh, different. A lot of software doesn't run on Linux, but you can get uh, emulators or something called Wine for uh, Linux that allows you to run native Windows apps on Linux. I haven't had a chance to screw around with that too much, but um, yeah, so it is it is a different world than than running Windows. And that's about it. Good luck. And if you don't try it, I will shove a battery up your butt. <laughs>